So if, if not zero harm, and zero harm is potentially leading us to think and, and manage what matters least, well then what is it that matters most? And can we put on our charts that we'll accept some harm? Now obviously this goes a little bit against the grain and I've sat in budget planning sessions and things where we were trying to put LTIs on our, on our annual budget chart and it was felt that all, all we could put was zero. We can't put a, a, a measure for the year that says we're going to have two LTIs. So can we accept some harm? Well, yeah, we can. And we already do. We, we use the concept of residual risk. We use the concept of acceptable risk. So we accept that there's risk in our business. And we, if we accept that there's risk, we also know that there's going to be some harm. Likewise, in our day-to-day -day life, we accept some level of risk. We play sport, we let our kids do things. We might go hunting or motorbike riding or whatever it is and we know that we're not going to be able to do all those things forever without getting hurt. We know that harming ourselves and the harm part is what makes it kind of hard to swallow. But hurting ourselves is part of what goes with those activities. Obviously James Reason talked a bit about it in what he calls his high reliability organisations and he talks about the fact that when these organisations accept that accidents can happen they become much more alert to them. And the other, the other classic example is people crossing the roads. Most people that get hit and injured by cars or killed by cars get hit at pedestrian crossings, pedestrian crossings or designated walkways. If you're going to jaywalk, if you're going to walk across a road at a, at somewhere that's not a crossing, you're not going to go on your phone, you're going to pay attention. And you're actually far less likely to be injured when you have made yourself aware that you are doing something risky and then an accident could happen. So here's my triangle. We saw it yesterday, um, pretty simple, it's the, the old iceberg, you near misses, minor injuries, temporary. Divide that up into three sort of injury categories. Uh, the, the orange being non-fatal but permanently disabling injuries. Fatalities and then the very top is our multiple fatalities. Those three at the top are what we call category one. So they're the things that change people's lives basically. They affect people's futures permanently. Our next stage down, our category two are the temporaries, maybe they're our LTIs, things that affect people and the way they live, but they get back to the way they were. And then at the bottom we've got our medical treatments and all those sort of things. So that model's okay and it's built off statistics, people counted all the numbers and realised there were some ratios and they looked a little bit like a triangle, but what it tends to suggest is that if you can erode away the bottom, it'll, it'll erode away the top. If you can have less near misses, milk the icebergs on the side and have less near misses injuries, you'll have less fatalities. That all of those near misses could have escalated to an injury, that could have escalated to a serious injury, could have escalated to a fatality. What I'm suggesting is that we push our triangle over and we just make it a different shape. We can still keep the triangle that everyone knows and loves and I'm sure I can even draw an iceberg that's the same shape. But now we're going to think about it a little bit differently. We're going to, we're going to think about the same levels but in vertical slices are our hazards and our injuries and the things that happen. And they can escalate. So the levels in this are based on an outcome. So someone has a vehicle accident and all they get is a broken arm or maybe they don't get injured at all and they sit down here. But we want to think about what could have happened. And a lot of our incident investigation forms that you guys have will prompt the person to say what was the likely outcome and we'll think about high potential incidents and we'll go away and investigate them differently. We need to be thinking about everything in that regard. When we have an accident or an incident or a hazard that's out there, what could it escalate to? Could it actually escalate into that top orange and red zone? If it's a rolled ankle, a twisted shoulder, a twisted back, a paper cut, they can't. Those injuries can't reasonably escalate to a fatality. Um, but then we have our other incidents, like vehicle accidents, things to do with electricity, failures of isolation, that could. They may not have. We might have had a failure of breach of isolation and the outcome was down here. But it could have escalated to the red. And if we do that, well then what we can do is split it in half. And we can think about, well, all of our safety systems, they're aimed at fatalities, but a lot of them, behavioural safety and all the things we've aimed at, are also aimed down the bottom. And we think if we can take slices off the triangle and we make the whole triangle smaller, then the top red section will get smaller. What I'm suggesting is, we need to do that, but we need to make sure we start from this top left corner. We need to start from the ones that attack those things that change people's lives permanently. So if we're going to take slices off the, off the triangle and we're going to stop injuries, let's make sure we're stopping injuries over here 
and not the ones that are over there. Even BHP on their website talk about the fact that they, uh, it's on the same page where they mentioned zero harm, talk about the fact that just because we, the ways that we manage injuries aren't necessarily <coughs> the same things that will prevent fatalities from occurring and that you need to have what they call obviously complementary, and I'm not suggesting anything, anything is so black and white, but a complementary effort on managing fatal risk. So how do we do it? How should we be thinking about our operations and our systems to manage what matters? So that we're taking the slices off the left of the triangle and attacking that top red corner. Well, what do we have at the moment? Let's think about our own sites. Let's think about the systems that we have, the risk methodologies, the inspections that we do, the interactions, the management walkarounds, the investigations, our procedures. Are 90% of them focused on fatalities and things on the left-hand side? Or are they focused on the bottom section of the triangle no matter where it sits. Do the things we do every day, the things we do in our workplace, focus on preventing fatalities? Because I think they should. And I guess we can talk again now about Deepwater Horizon and those same VIPs are out there, part of BP's method of going, sending people from corporate office to walk around the sites, as, as a lot of our companies do. They were there to do safety inspections. Now the two guys that happened to be there were actually Quite, uh, quite expert and quite experienced in the sealing of the boreholes, the exact thing that the guys on the rig were doing that day and having problems with, trying to get the cement to set that would seal up the borehole. The two guys from the corporate office actually knew quite a bit about that, had quite a bit of experience. They stopped by the room where the management team were puzzling over what was going wrong and what was happening and what might happen, but they decided, like we do when we come from corporate office to visit, it's a bit of a crisis going on site. We'll leave, we'll leave the site, we don't want to interfere. We'll go away and do our safety inspections. And, and in this case, they had two things they wanted to look at. One guy had a, had a learning from another rig about uh, slips and step treads. So he wanted to go and check that this rig had complied and put all their step treads in place. And the other guy had a bit of a, an issue he wanted to follow up about the inspections of uh, working height harnesses. It's not the quality of them, but making sure they've been inspected and tagged properly. So that was what they went and looked at. In the meantime, in another room, the events were being put in play that they could have assisted with had they come with a focus on looking at what are the catastrophic risks and how can we as managers interact with those. And I guess I've got a quote here, and, and BP are fairly well known now for numerous incidents in their culture. A former BP employee said this, I have been dissatisfied with the way senior BP management focused so heavily on the easy part of safety. They focused on holding the handrails, they spent hours discussing the merits of reverse parking and the dangers of not having a lid on a coffee cup. But they were less enthusiastic about the hard stuff, about investing in and maintaining their complex facilities. To put it even more bluntly, BP was taking a don't sweat the big stuff attitude towards safety. So how do we manage it? Well, what's our different, slightly different approach to managing things that could have a fatality or catastrophic outcome? Controls. We want to think about controls. And we've done a lot of work on controls again over the last 10 to 15 years as our risk, risk methodology has developed. And we predominantly look for additional controls. So we sit in a risk assessment, we do our columns, we do our score, and then we ask the group, what additional controls should we put in place? It's a bit of stunt science, no one really knows. Well, I think we're coming to the point now where we've nearly got all our controls. We've got management systems, procedures, we've got everything down to our take fives. There's some new controls coming or already arriving, things like proximity detection and a few engineering controls that are arriving. But what we need to do now is start to look at our current controls and see how well they're working. Are they doing what we thought they were doing in the field and are they working 100% of the time? We need to focus on those controls, on the ones we've already got, and figure out if they're working well. Now we've got hundreds and thousands of controls on our side, everything from PPE and inductions and training all the way through to hardware and plant design. So we want to think about critical controls. So we want to think about what are those ones on site that are the critical things we do to prevent fatalities and catastrophic risks from occurring. We want to identify those. And how would I define, how do I define critical controls? We want to think about what are the non-negotiables. What are the ones that we have? We just depend on every single day to be working 100% of the time. And when they fail, or when they're absent, the risk goes through the roof. 
So you take away all your isolation procedures, take away any sort of road rules on site, take away safe equipment design, take away those things and all of a sudden the risk goes through the roof. Think about some other controls that aren't critical, take them away, JSAs, take fives, PPE, take those things away but make the critical controls work 100% of the time and your risk won't change significantly. So what should we do? Well first we need to work out what our critical controls are. We need to define them, figure out what they are, so that we can raise the awareness of them. And then we need to look at them in detail and think about where are the holes. So if we think about the old Swiss cheese model as being the holes lining up, so there's a lot of different slices in that cheese. They're all the controls, and all those controls have got holes in them. None of them are 100% perfect. If our controls worked 100% of the time, we wouldn't have incidents. So what we need to do is not wait for an incident and an investigation to show us where the hole was. We need to be proactive and find the holes find the weaknesses in our critical controls and close them. Do whatever we can to reduce the risk. And then we need to talk to our teams and our guys and our crews about critical, the idea of critical controls and what are the non-negotiable things that, keep, that are designed to keep them alive and that need to work. And go out and observe and think and talk and communicate about that. And communicate about keeping our eye on the ball with fatality prevention. So, zero harm. Look, I think it's a great, I think it was a great target. I think we've had some good times together, the mining industry and zero harm. But I think, and I worry, that it's taking our eye off, <coughs> off the ball, potentially. And we won't know it until, it until it hits us in the face. We need to think about our triangle a little bit differently. We need to think about preventing early minor, minor incidents and investigating them. But putting special focus on those ones that could have risen to the top of the triangle and put us in the red section. Trying to, let's first of all worry about getting rid of that whole half of the triangle from our industry. And that'll get that line a little bit closer to zero, and then we can worry about all the rest. It makes us a safer place at work than it is at home, or a safer place for us than it is at a primary school as a teacher. And how do we do that? We should do that by thinking about controls. Don't worry about additional controls. We're getting to the limit of adding more controls to our chart, but we need to go back now and look at the ones we've got. How well are they working? Are they adequate? Are they effective? Do they work 100% of the time? And where are the weaknesses? So, zero harm. As I said, it's been good. And I know that different companies have different definitions, but in my opinion, it's time for us to move on and to start to think about what matters most. Thanks.